Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm Corey Heights, the founder of Prep Athletics. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about prep school, prep school basketball, recruiting, and life in general. This is our second interview on the podcast, and I'd like to welcome a personal friend of mine, my my uncle on my dad's side, Tom Heights. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Corey. Now, Tom, how do we know each other? Well, by blood, all right? Your brother, your, your brother, your father's my brother. And obviously we have a basketball family. And so you were just a natural progression of the line of basketball players in uh, our family. Why don't you tell us about uh, all five members of the Heights family and, and where you fit in that? Well, uh, in, in my bloodline with your dad, the direct is our mother and father, obviously. And then uh, three of the five played basketball and my oldest uh, brother, your uncle Jim was 6'11", played at University of Oklahoma. And then your dad, seven foot, University of West Virginia, and then myself, 6'9", playing at the University of Kentucky. The other two siblings, my sister, uh, Rosie was 6'4", didn't want to play basketball. She would have been a, a, you know, instant success, but didn't like basketball. And then my brother, your uncle Phil, is 6'4", was probably the best jumper in the family. He could 360 degree dunk, but didn't even play high school basketball. So why? I don't know. He just said he didn't like it, but he was talented and probably like a, a David Thompson almost. So wow. that's the history of your, uh, of my family, your lineage. Yeah, and you grew up in Northeast Indiana. Your dad was a farmer, mom was a nurse. You didn't have the internet back then. You didn't have TV coverage. So why, why was it basketball and not baseball or football or some other sport? Well, for me personally, I played all the sports of football. I actually played football uh, only in junior high because I was built like Woody from Toy Story. So, uh, I took one hit on a kickoff return and the guy hit me so hard. I was a seventh grader and it was an eighth grader. It looked like the big kid from the Goonies hit me so hard that the face, the helmet turned where I was looking out of the, the ear hole. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe football is just not my game. So I stuck with uh, basketball. I did baseball, uh, track and field, golf. And the reason I did all those sports is because our school was so small. There was only 55 in my senior class. Now, I didn't go to the same high school as your, your dad and your uncles because we moved to a different farm. So back in the day, we were the original Bo Jacksons, not just me, but several of my teammates. Like I might have to pitch a couple innings of the baseball field, and then I'd run over to the track and run the 440 or do the high jump in my baseball uh, uniform and then go back and then play first base because you couldn't go back and pitch once you left the game. So there were several of us doing that. But basketball was the natural sport, you know, for the family. So that's what I stuck with. And, you know, with our height and the family tradition, it's just, it was a natural thing. But now a lot of kids are specialized in their sport and you played different ones. Did you, did you get any benefit from playing track and field or baseball and the other sports? just bonding with my classmates and being able to do other sports. And nowadays that probably wouldn't happen. Maybe two sports, maybe baseball in the spring and, and basketball in the, in the winter. But yeah, I mean, you learn different disciplines and whatnot. And I had some great coaches and really the coaches that were baseball or football were also the basketball coaches too. Uh, if they were a head coach in one, there's probably an assistant coach in the other sport. So that was good, but couldn't do what I did back then now, because especially in basketball, you usually stay pretty specialized. Right. You did, uh, we'll get to where you played in college in a, in a little bit here, but how did you know, when was the moment that you knew you were actually good? The moment I knew when I was actually good, probably when... In high school, we only did it two years, and I'll tell you why. 
It's when the, uh, the freshmen would play the sophomores, the juniors would play the seniors. And this was, uh, I think my, yeah, freshman year. So we beat the sophomores and we almost beat the seniors. So wow. the freshman basketball team almost beat the seniors. And then the next year, sophomores, we just, we, we mowed over everybody. And I think that's at the point I thought, even at a small school that I'm somebody, you know, I've arrived. You know, that was my impression. You know, there was a lot to learn from there, but to answer your question, that's when at least I thought in my mind that I was a good player. Gotcha. Now, fast forward, you become one of the better players in the state. Uh, you must have started to get recruited. When was the first time a coach called you or the first time you got a college offer? Do you remember that? Yeah, I believe it was actually your dad. Your dad had talked to somebody at Ohio Valley something. I think it's in Parkersburg where you guys lived. And I don't even know if they was NAIA or Division Three or whatever, but he said, yeah, they're offering you a scholarship when I was a sophomore in high school. So it was kind of exciting, like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. You know, it's like natural human need is to be wanted. Like, well, this is great, you know. I don't even know if that college still exists or the name of it, but I know it was in, uh, I believe, in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Right. That's a good first story there. And then you obviously progressed and started getting more and more offers without AAUs. So back in the late 70s when you were playing high school ball, how did people find out about you? Were, were, were head coaches popping into your small gym? Were they popping into the farm? Were they calling you on your phone? How, how did rec What did recruiting look like back in the late 70s? for a good player like yourself? In the late 70s, we didn't have the internet yet. We had uh, newspapers and magazines. They had Hoosier Hysteria magazine in Indiana. And so I would gather that most coaches would subscribe to that, get that in the mail, look at it. And if you were lucky, maybe they would call you, invite you to their camp. And that's really how things got started. My first basketball camp was after my sophomore year at uh, West Virginia University. So that's where your dad played. So I thought, well, natural, let's go there. Because, you know, I thought that would be a cool place to play. So I went there to play. And at most of the camps back in those days, they would have other coaches from different universities, friends of the head coach come in to help, to speak, anything to add value to the camp. So after that camp, that was in the summer of 77, there was now on the radar, I was on the radar more because I was out there and basically it was like a, a, a camp. Uh, what do you call them? A combine. So that's when I started to get more notoriety. I should say people got on their radar and started to get more attention. Gotcha. Now your mom and dad, farmer, nurse, they obviously went through this with uh, your older brothers, Mike and Jim. What did they think about basketball in college and, and, and the phone calls you were getting? Were they, did they know what was going on? Were they in touch with it? Did they just think it was something um, that could get you in the college for free? What were their thoughts? Their thoughts were, you, you can do whatever you want as long as you get the pigs slopped and the, the hay baled and gather the eggs in the chicken coop. So they were all on board as long as you got the chores done on the farm. Were they involved in all in your decisions? No, other than just supporting us and taking us where we need to be. That was a nice thing because I wouldn't have liked that of just having a helicopter parent, you know, trying to push me somewhere. I do know my dad, the way they treated me, um, you know, where I ended up going to school at University of Kentucky, he loved it there. They always treated him and my mom like uh, king and queen royalty. So I bet I'm pretty sure that he was happy that I made that choice because he really liked it there. But he also liked it West Virginia too, where your, your dad played his other son. But as far as influencing that, they basically said, no, you, it's going to be your choice. So if something doesn't go right, that's on you. You can't be a victim and start blaming everybody else of whatever. So that was on me. And I appreciate that. Gotcha. Now, when it came down to it, sophomore year, you got started getting some notice and, then you started getting some final schools. One story I want you to tell is on your recruiting trip to one of your final schools, University of Kentucky, you had a couple other 
big time players on that recruiting trip with you. Yeah, actually there was only two of us there that weekend. And what really impressed me, it was me and this guy, he was a, a minor player named Ralph Sampson. <laughs> he was seven, four, and he wanted to come to Kentucky because we had already had Sam Bowie. Um, we had a number one recruiting class that year and, and Ralph wanted to come here. The story is his mom wouldn't sign the papers because she wanted him to go to Virginia and stay close to home. But Ralph was there, I was there, and what really impressed me about Kentucky is that even though he was the consummate McDonald's All-American, and I was more like the, the Dixie Cream Donut All-American, you know, that's, uh, I just made that up, but he was the premier recruit in that week, but they still treated me like royalty there. And uh, I often tell people it was either Ralph Sampson or me, and they was waiting on my decision whether to <laughs> offer him a scholarship. So. Since I accepted, they uh, cut off his scholarship. Oh, that's yeah. my story, and I'm sticking with it. Yeah, well, you chose Kentucky, but what were your other final schools, and what that that you were down, you know, to choose between to attend college and play for? Who is the other competition with Kentucky, and why ultimately did you pick Kentucky? Well, naturally, Gail Catlin was the head coach of West Virginia. Naturally, that's where your dad played. They really came at me hard. Uh, loved the people there. Great school. So that was one I thought automatically I was going to uh, attend. That was going to be the first choice. But then I always secretly you know, thought, wow, Kentucky is so cool. And we, when I went down there for camp, and I'll talk about that next, and open up things and they were interested, that was a whole new level. Now, I did visit Ohio State on an unofficial visit. Uh, the same thing with Western Kentucky. Actually, Gene Cady was the head coach there, and they flew up a private jet to pick me up and wined and dined me uh, for a game and uh, then flew me back. So that was pretty interesting. And let's see. So it was West Virginia, Kentucky, Western Kentucky, Ohio State, and then there was a minor consideration of Purdue. So, but Kentucky was always in the the forefront of where I wanted to go and ultimately ended up. Now you were runner up to Mr. Basketball in the state of Indiana, your senior year. So logically did Bobby Knight recruit you? Oh, that's a great story. He did. <laughs> and my coach, my head coach, high school coach loved Bobby Knight, loved IU. So I was like, Hey, let's go down there and visit. It was an unofficial visit. And I reluctantly said yes. Had to drive five hours from northern Indiana down to Bloomington and went there. And Coach Hall, or not Coach Hall, Coach Knight was like, almost like he was giving me a, just a, a real dress down. Like, uh, and I couldn't understand the same thing with the assistant coaches. Now, that's not to take away from his coaching or the school, but it's like, I didn't want to go there. And he treated me like I was, uh, you know, getting ready to go to boot camp. And we left there, and then he found out that Kentucky was one of the schools, you know, entertaining me. He hated Kentucky, still hates Kentucky. And we get a letter that says they're no longer recruiting me. <laughs> and I thought, and that's the only school that ever sent or called to say, hey, I'm not recruiting you anymore. And it's kind of like having a, a, a girl that you don't want to go out with. And then she sends you a letter. Hey, I have no interest in going out with you. Right. And you're going like, I didn't even want to go out with you. So right. that was my IU stories. And if you talk to other players, I'll have another guy interview. He'll have a good Bobby Knight story as well. He ended up going to Kansas. But now, would I have thrived under Coach Knight? Yes. Very disciplined. My game was one that he would have loved. And I had several of my friends from the Indiana All-Stars that played for him. And I know if you worked hard, and you followed what he wanted you to do, which I would have, you know, I would have had a good career there. But that's not to take away what I did at Kentucky because I wouldn't change a thing. But Coach Knight's a great coach, uh, ran a great program, and that's just my story. And I'm okay. glad I didn't go there. And you also mentioned Coach Huggins, who's now going to be in the Hall of Fame in the near future, recruited you. And he, he had, you got a fun story about that too, right? Real good story. And I can't remember if he was an assistant in Akron or West Virginia, but 
he was coming out to Northeast Indiana to do a recruiting visit to meet the parents and everything. So it was going to be like maybe six at night, which actually six at night was almost getting ready for bedtime for my dad. And, you know, again, we didn't have cell phones back then. The only thing you had was pay phones if you could find it. So it's like six o'clock, no coach Huggins, seven o'clock, no coach Huggins, eight (laughs) o'clock, finally get a call. And that's when you'd answer all your calls, you know, ring, ring, ring. It's like, yeah, it's a, I'm lost here. I'm in this place called Butler, Indiana. It's like five miles from our house, but he's in the middle of nowhere. He's lost. So I get in the car and go retrieve him so he can follow us there. Now, at this point, my dad was a little upset because he's tired, he's cranky. And uh, Coach Huggins does his dog and pony show and everything. And I don't end up going uh, to West Virginia or Akron. Again, I can't remember where he was an assistant at the time. But it was a great story that, uh, yeah, he was lost. And you get lost where we grew up, you are lost. So that's a story. Right. But I remember uh, my father, Mike, telling me that your dad did love when coaches came to town because they would take the whole family out to restaurants. And that was special occasions back in the day. Do you remember that? I never had that with my recruitment. Because remember, I'm like 10 years younger than your dad and, and my other uncles, your other uncles. So we never had that. But recruiting changed, just like now recruiting has changed. But we never had that. So I believe the only home visit we had was Coach Huggins, Coach Hall. And there was a coach from Wisconsin and a couple others. And they just sat at the dinner table and we probably fed them. I would imagine your grandma, my mom fed them something good and gave them some good iced tea or lemonade. Right. And that was the extent. So we never got to go out to eat, which that was okay. Cause it got to the point, the recruiting got real crazy, uh, real crazy. And just a, that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, keep talking. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So that after my, let's see, sophomore year went to the camp. And then after my junior year, you know, recruiting started to pick up and I got an opportunity. This was 1978 university of Kentucky just won the NCAA championship against Duke. I'm like loving university of Kentucky. So I go down there to camp and this is almost like a back in the day, they call it the five star camp where these were the top players, high school players. So Ralph Sampson was there. Uh, Derry Cord, uh, let's see, Dominique Wilkins, James Worthy. These are some good players. So now I'm down there and some other guys that were high school All-Americans, but they never made it in the pros. And uh, they, at the end of the week, they chose a 20-person All-Star team, 10 on each side. And I remember prepping for this camp and my coach saying, you know, you're going to make a mark by how well you move without the ball. Not your offense, not your defense, which was good advice because I'm going to tell you what, I was used to playing ball against 6'4", six, 6'5", six, white guys as a center. And now I had seven foot black guys that could jump and had arms as long as a gymnasium. So my turnaround jumper would just get beat back up into the stands. So... I learned how to play hard defense, be in their face, block out. The basic fundamentals, it just irritates me when I see kids nowadays, even NBA players, they don't block out. So I did all that and ended up making the 20-person all-star team, which, by the way, I think four of those people on that 20-person all-star team are in the Hall of Fame now. I'm not one of them. I'm still waiting for the nomination, (laughs) but, uh, you know. It's uh, that's how good it was. So after that, on the recruiting, that's when things just opened up wide and literally got letters from every prominent school in the country then, including every Ivy League school, which was kind of funny because I can't imagine playing basketball at Yale or Harvard, but that would have been kind of cool. But my eyes were set on Kentucky and that's what I focused on. So Right. So I was going to ask you about your first pickup game at Kentucky when you were there as a freshman, but it sounds like it wouldn't have compared almost to that 10 on 10 all-star game at the five-star camp or was it, I guess those guys were older at Kentucky. So what, what was that like the first time you stepped in a court at 
the UK and you've got these men, these all Americans, these, these future NBA guys, like what was that like? They're faster, they're quicker, they're stronger and they're more talented. And I'm like, wow, I've got a lot of work to do, which I proceeded to work hard for the next five years. But it was like, one of these things where you jump in and then you realize, wow, I jumped in and I'm underneath the water now. So I'm going to have to hold my breath and get to the surface. And what I mean by that is I'm going to have to really dedicate. And I worked hard in high school, but this is a new level. And the first practice was, well, actually I should say the first practice was in the summer and there's a story to that too, but in the summer and all the programs now, you're working hard. You're basically doing practices in the summer, but these were men and I was a boy. <laughs> so I got schooled, everything pushed around. It was like, oh my goodness, this is a whole new level. And, uh, you know, one of the most important points when you talk about my first practice, I'll say I was hanging with my, uh, Mr. Basketball from Indiana, Steve Bush, who's just uh, unfortunately passed away a couple months ago, was at his watermelon farm down in Washington, Indiana. He ended up going to IU playing for Bobby Knight and had a good career there. But I was hanging with him on the watermelon farm, and I got a call from Dwayne Casey, who was our assistant coach, played at Kentucky, who's the head coach of the Detroit Pistons now. And, you know, he said, you have a dinner with one of our boosters on so-and-so date. Well, you know, it's not that I was a bad kid or anything like that, but I thought, well, what the heck, if I don't show up, I'm having so much fun down here in Washington, Indiana on the farm and the watermelon farm. Why do I need to go to that? Well, I missed that. <laughs> I get a call from coach Casey uh, at the Bushy's house. And he says, I'm really disappointed in you. And I'm like, well, why? What did I do? I set up a meeting with one of our boosters. And what you did was not very becoming of a Kentucky basketball player. Well, I can tell you, I felt from 6'9", I went to about 3'9", because that's really not in my character. But it was a good lesson that a lot of people have to go through to realize that, you know, especially when you play, go to a college, whether it's a Kentucky, a, a D2, NAIA prep school, there's much more expected of you. And that's to be a, a leader. And I didn't exhibit very good leadership there, responsibility. So I never forget that. I remind him occasionally, I'm thanking for that because that embarrassed me, but in a good way, because it's, it's not just the athletics, it's the academics and the attitude that you have to have as well. So that was one of the things that I really appreciate from him and my whole experience, what they trained us there. And we were probably one of the first colleges to teach on how to handle the media, how to handle the press, how to dress. We traveled with coat and tie. Every place we went, coat and tie, you wouldn't wear sweats to school, meaning to class. And they taught you how to be, you know, a good leader and a good man. So that, that I appreciate, but more colleges are doing that now because it is more than just the sport. That's important. Right. What was the best part about being a UK basketball player? <laughs> There's a lot of best parts. I would say like when you're part of a fraternity, when you're part of a group, when you're part of a a brotherhood, sisterhood, there's something you can't replace that feeling. So being part of the Kentucky Brotherhood and feeling that closeness to people that I played with, people that I didn't that were younger than me, and even that brotherhood and kinship that I feel to, to players that are younger than me, like Anthony Davis, Carl Anthony Towns, Demetrius, uh, or, uh, DeMarcus Cousins, John Wall, that's a brotherhood. That's a fraternity and it feels good. That's, that's a good part. And it's, it's that pride 
when you hear and see things about Kentucky basketball, that that's, that's probably the best part there. What about the worst part? Worst part is the same thing. You're so prominent that when things go bad, something happens with the university, a player does something uh, that's not becoming of, you know, who we aspire to be as a good leader and a good athlete it reflects on all of us. You know, there could be uh, something with the law. There could be something with, uh, you know, the way you've handled your money in the NBA or you've done something in the NBA or just out personally, because if something happens to us, it makes front page news. And so it happens. And that's probably the worst part because you have to take the good with the not so good. So the spectrum if you have a spectrum that's wide on the, on the uh, good side, just know that the spectrum on the other side, when things go south or go bad, is going to be just as tenuous on the negative side. So that's probably the worst part. So that's what you have to be aware of. You know? And again, if you're a, an athlete looking to go to a big school, you're going to have to deal with that. If you go to a smaller school where it's not as media crazy, then you don't have to deal with that. So that's always an important part of people when they, uh, athlete, when they want to decide on what school they want to attend as an athlete. Right. When you played for five years at Kentucky, the two guys you were backing up both became lottery picks in the 1984 draft. So every day you're lacing up your shoes, you're playing two of the best big men in the country every single day. Now, what was your mindset? Were you trying to beat them every day so you'd get minutes? Or was it one of those things where no matter how good you played in practice, you weren't getting minutes? And if so, like, how was your mindset for five years of just trying to break through those guys to, to get on the floor? Well, number one, what was my job? It's not the same as when I was in high school where I <clears throat> averaged, you know, 28 points a game and 18 rebounds a game. Okay, that wasn't my my job at Kentucky. My job at Kentucky was to get in there when they need me, whether it's foul trouble or something, a special situation to be ready. You know, I was like the uh, coast guard. So when you get to play against guys like that, the reason I went to Kentucky is not to get minutes. It was to become the best player in person I could be. So that afforded me the chance to play against two lottery picks, really three, uh, with Kenny Walker. You know, in my last two years, he was a lottery pick too. So that whole front line was lottery picks. So you're going to get better. And I like that because you don't want to be the top dog all the time because you never get better, whether that's in athletics or life. So my mindset was like, I'm going to get better. I'm going to learn. I'm going to take it. I'm going to try to take them down every single day. I'll try to dunk on them. And I did at times, a lot of times I got that put right back in my face, but I just didn't, wouldn't quit. And the irony is, and this is going to sound egotistical, but this is a, a mindset the top athletes have. If you put me in the bubble right now at age almost 60, I'd feel that I'd go right at LeBron James and Anthony Davis if I was playing the Lakers and take it right at them. Now, the reality is about one time down the court, something would snap, crack or pop. But that's the mindset that's in my psyche that I developed in those five years. And, and you've got to have that. You just have to have just no fear and you become calm with that. Yeah. And that's fun. And you say, well, how will you do that when other people feel the same way? That's like a game of chess with another great chess master. If you're a great chess master and you're playing against another great chess master, that becomes fun. So that was the intrigue of that, but it's not for everybody. But wasn't there a story that coach Hall, he would say, if, if, if Tom stops you, Sam, the whole team's running, what please elaborate on that story right there. Cause it, for you, when you succeeded, the team got punished. Oh yeah. Well, elaborate well, that on that for me. Because, you know, I'd be in the second squad, so to speak, you know, you'd have the first squad of Sam Bowie, Melvin Turpin, Kenny Walker, Kyle Macy, you know, all these great players. And then you'd have the second squad. That's part of me. So I was lining up against center. Melvin was a center. Sam was a forward. 
So most of the time I'm going against Melvin, but if I, if I beat him down the floor, if I scored on him, blocked the shot or whatever, ruined their play, then they're the first team coach Hall would be upset and make us do it again or make us all run. And it got to the point where it's like, well, what's the point of that? But I didn't care. And actually my teammates would get mad. Why are you doing that? Cause we're warriors. We go in there against Duke or North Carolina or Kansas. We can't, you can't just now turn it on. You know what Iverson said? It's just practice. Practice is what makes you a warrior, makes you tough. And that's how I just, you know, wanted to run my life in the way my career is. Because the thing is, if a school gives you a scholarship, you're an employee. Now you better get your job done for them. And that's really what I felt. I was the blue and white University of Kentucky Wildcat through and through. I'm going to honor them because they honored me with a scholarship. I'm going to bust my tail as much as I can. Gotcha. Now you did go up against these guys every day in practice, but that meant limited playing time for you throughout your career, but you did have some, some highlights. And I know one of your, your famous uh, highlights is a play that involved Charles Barkley on national TV. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah. So I would get, um, I would get my time when Melvin or Sam was in foul trouble. They're having a tough time. And and for whatever reason, well, I know what the reason is. Melvin had a tough time with Charles Barkley. The reason is Charles Barkley was a freshman when Melvin was a junior or maybe a sophomore. I can't remember the days, but you looked at Barkley and you said, this guy is Charles Barkley. They talk about the round mound or rebound. He was about 300 pounds and look like fat Albert. And it's like, he took one step one time and dunked over Melvin and Melvin just was never the same. So where does that lead to? There was a lot of times that I would go in the game against Auburn with Charles Barkley and have to deal with this guy. So there was one time where they're bringing the ball down and here's Charles has the ball. I am going to take a charge I'm set up because he's he's gonna gonna mow over me and it's one of those times where either I step to the side or I try to be a hero and stand there and take a charge well I'm gonna take the charge and and this is on national tv right it's on national tv yes okay CBS probably game of the week or something like that yeah CBS NBC with Al McGuire who knows one of those but he's just he lines up and I seen common and it was almost like probably a Catholic prayer. I said, you know, <laughs> protect me, Father. You know? And I he was so forceful. I put my hands up like a cross, like the Wakanda, you know, thing from Black Panther. Cause it's like this is gonna hurt. But I have a a 38 inch inseam, and Charles has a 38 inch vertical leap. Well, start matching those things up in the location. And he kicked me right in that spot that you don't want to be kicked in. And I go flying back. They call a charge on him. And I just fly into the, the, uh, the cheerleaders underneath the uh, basket. And it's funny because there's that moment where everybody sees what happens, and especially men. And they're like, you hear the whole 24,000, probably at home too, on TV going, oh, you know. And then kind of like a laughter because then it's funny, but I'm laying there grabbing myself, rolling, just like, oh my God, that hurt. And the cheerleaders are just like around me. And it's embarrassing because what are you gonna do? Nobody can help soothe you at that point. It's just a matter of time that you gotta let it, you gotta let it play out. But I got the charge, um, he went out of the game. So I came out of the game too, but that was one of the key turning points because now he wasn't able to play because of foul trouble. Have you gone trying to find that clip on YouTube or in archives anywhere? I will have to because I was down at university uh, at the basketball office a couple of years ago, and they said they were on a big project of taking all that, whatever the uh, film is, the canisters, and putting it on digital format. So I would love to see it because there's a few games that my, my kids don't even know. They can't comprehend. And I want to see some of those highlighted parts like that, but I would love to see that. Right. I remember at my, at our, your mom, my grandma's house, there was a tape of uh, Kentucky against Tennessee and you actually got prominent minutes. And the only thing I remember is you just kept getting fouled and kept shooting free throws. 
that oh, seemed yeah. to be your bread and butter right there. I still hold the record at the University of Kentucky for fouls drawn per minutes played. Mm -hmm. And I believe that I got to look at my stats again. I believe I took more free throw attempts in my career at UK than I did field goal attempts. Wow. So John Thompson, uh, senior just passed away uh, in the mm -hmm. past few days and your last game in college was in the final four 1984 in Seattle the kingdom and your last game was against Patrick Ewing and you guys had a great first half then tell me tell me how the second half of the last game of your career ended uh it was like prelude to a kiss if you not a lot of people know that movie but there was a there was a kiss given and then everything changed. And we went into that locker room. Everybody thinks that Coach Hall said something or did something, and it wasn't. It was just one of those games where not one starter made a field goal the second half. And wasn't your stats like it was three for 33? I think that number, <laughs> yes. I can't yes. forget it for some reason, but yeah, three for 33. Three for 33. And it was just, there was like a lid on the basket. It just wasn't happening. It wasn't fear. The year before, when we was in the Elite Eight with Louisville, in overtime, that would, I would say, fear, or we just choked. This one, you could say we choked, but I would say it's different. It's just it didn't happen. It was almost like the, the following year when Georgetown played Villanova, <laughs> and almost the same thing happened, where if you played them nine out of ten times, they're going to beat Villanova. But on that night, in that scenario, it didn't happen. And that's what we had to face in the kingdom. It's just lights were out, prelude to a kiss. Wow. And then that ended. And then a few months later was probably one of the most uh, star packed NBA drafts ever. You had Michael Jordan, Akeem Olajuwon, your teammates were both lottery picks with Sam Bowie and Melvin Turpin. I think John Stockton was in there and many more. And you actually got drafted too in the eighth round by the Indiana Pacers. Yeah, now, part of that star-studded uh, <laughs> 1984. Uh, yeah, you, and technically you are. So tell tell me how that works, because now everyone everyone's always declaring early. Not everyone. That's a big statement, but people are always declaring for the draft now. The big thing is, hey, I got to pick the right school to go to the right NBA team and to get get groomed for it. But back then, with ten rounds, they they drafted a lot of people. So back in '84, you get drafted. Is there a party or what? Just tell me the scenario that went around with that. Um, I was actually driving back from a camp in, from Newark, New Jersey. And that camp was, there was a lot of foreign coaches there to evaluate, you know, if you didn't make it to the NBA or if you did, you know, they, they, you know, they were scouting you. So I'm driving back on, <laughs> I-64, and I hear it on the radio that I was drafted. So they said, well, Tom Heights, uh, it was a Kentucky radio station. I was drafted in the eighth round, the first pick of the eighth round. And then the, I don't even know if they had green room parties back then. Uh, but I did get a, like a telegraph letter from the Indiana Pacers inviting me to rookie camp. So there was no parties. There was no fanfare, um, didn't get invited to New York to put on the hat. It was just, hey, get home and uh, prepare for the uh, rookie camp. And tell me about that rookie camp, because I think from what I remember, you said that was the best shape you were in your life, the best. You were just tuned. And tell me about how that rookie camp turned out. I was in the best shape of my life, and a week before, we had played – in like a charity game against University of Louisville uh, alum, which meant a lot of their guys that went to the NBA. And I remember I got elbowed in the back of my ribs and cracked the rib. I think it was Wiley Brown just nailed me. And I had a cracked rib. And I'm thinking, wow, I've got a week to go to NBA camp and I got a cracked rib. So I actually wore like a neoprene wrap around my midsection. And this is something not too many people know. I had a friend that who was a prominent veterinarian and 
he gave me this thing that they gave to horses called DMSO. I don't know what the technical name is, but that's, it was like in crystal. It looked like uh, crystal salt. So he said, some people have taken this to lower inflammation that could help with your rib. So I guess I was doping to go to uh, a rookie camp. And so I had that and I thought rookie camp would mean you just go through the motions. That's what people said. But this camp, we were running drills. We were tired. It was hot because it was in August. And I made it through with that crack rib, even though I got hit there a couple times. But it was brutal. And at the end of there, at the camp, uh, George Irvin and Donnie Walsh had me in their office and said, you know, they were cutting me. They appreciate the time that I had spent there. And uh, that was the commencement of my three-day NBA career. And I had a guaranteed contract of $75, 25 bucks per day per diem. Wow. Did you blow that right away or did you invest it in, uh, in some good stocks? Well, I should have bought Yahoo back then, but I didn't. But uh, yeah, food was cheap there. And maybe, a, yeah. yeah, yeah, it, it didn't go far. Well, as you know, obviously prep athletics is a prep school. You know, we, we focus on prep schools, prep school basketball, prep school recruiting, and um, we got it. We're getting ready to finish up here soon. But your your actual college roommate at Kentucky, Melvin Turpin, went to prep school. And Melvin, from what I understand, was a senior at Bryan Station. He was tall and skinny and just needed an extra year to develop, which is what we tell, you know, big kids even today, 40 years later. Um, tell me what you noticed, because you knew Melvin, I think, uh, before you went to prep school, and then you knew him after. Tell me what changes you saw both mentally and physically after his year at Fork Union. Well, he was seven foot, six eleven, seven foot, 185 pounds went to Fork Union. Uh, he needed help academically and he had to grow into his body. By the time he got to Kentucky the next year, he was a freshman as a sophomore, even though we were the same age. I remember them putting him on these banana, peanut butter, protein powder shakes and just making him gain weight. And then eventually he started putting on some muscle and some bulk and I can tell you, without that year of prep school, he wouldn't have been a lottery pick and wouldn't have had a successful college career. He needed that. More players than not need an extra year. I probably could have used an extra year because my body wasn't quite mature, nor the emotional and mental uh, skill sets that you have to have are not developed typically in high school. I don't care how much AAU, I don't care how good your team is how good your coaches are, your parents, it's a different game. Sometimes prep school is one of the best things you can do. I highly recommend it. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing that, you know, we, we've talked about that before with a lot of families and a lot of players is that, you know, boys become men sometime between 16 and 22. And there's not much you can do. It's just one of those things where your DNA will turn on and you'll start packing on muscle. You'll start, uh, you know, just showing more man characteristics and you might be doing the same, eating the same food, doing the same lifting you've always done. It's just, it's just when your time comes. Um, and it sounds like his turned on then. Were, were you, when did you become a man? Like, like probably when you showed up on campus, I'm guessing you were still kind of a boy. Uh, was there like a time when like the weight room and everything started clicking and you started getting bigger? What, what year was that or how old were you in college? Um, physically, I started to grow into my body my sophomore year, um, mentally and emotionally, maybe at age 27. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a lot. That's, that was a lot and everybody develops differently, but, but physically my sophomore year started to, Kentucky was known for the weightlifting program in basketball. We were just big and mean and We'd practice that on each other, just like gladiators fighting in the Coliseum amongst each other. And then by the time we got to the, before the conference schedule, we just beating on people. But probably my sophomore year, as I started to fill out, was squatting 500 pounds, uh, cleaning 300 pounds. And basketball players just have unbelievable core strength and leg strength. That's one of the things. I could bench press probably about half a bar, maybe a, a couple duck feathers I could bench press. You know, it's very weak upper body. 
but lower body, you know, was really strong. Gotcha. So yeah, every, and everybody's different. I mean, Charles Hurt, one of my classmates, he came in looking like a Greek Adonis, like he'd been lifting weights his whole life. I mean, he was rock solid V shape. Um, he was just naturally strong coming in. But again, I, I came in like Woody from Toy Story. Right. Our last question here, if you could go back in time and tell your, your 18 year old self, your fr- right before you step on campus at Kentucky, if you could give yourself some advice now that you're uh, in your, in your later fifties, what would that be? Huh. Well, I could have used a little more prep time to mature as a individual because I'm away from home the first time academics were exceedingly difficult and the pressure and the pressure we had at Kentucky was just unbelievable. I wish I would tell that myself to say, find a good prep school and go to it personally, because I needed to grow into my body physically, but also had to work on my mental, emotional and academics. And it's nice if you learn how to get a routine going away from home where especially where you're the man, you need to be in a place where now you're going to be uh, in service and you're going to be a part of a team and not going to be just the man. That, that was a transition as well. So a prep school would have helped with that in several ways. That's what I would say. And yeah, because you just need time to mature that going from 18 right into school with not only academics, that's challenging enough, but now add athletics wow and leadership it's a lot to take in all at once yeah well thanks for sharing that thanks for hopping on this interview today you know you have helped me a lot throughout my basketball career and life i've called you with all types of questions since i've been in junior high uh, up all the way until you know yesterday we're talking about life too so uh, it's good having you as family i'm lucky i was born into it and um I really appreciate hopping on here and, and sharing some wisdom and some stuff that people might not know about, you know, being an elite athlete, being recruited and playing at the number one program in the country, then getting drafted. So I think you shared some great insight today and uh, you actually too, I'm giving you credit as well to uh, helping me through getting this podcast going. So uh, thanks for all you've done for that and, uh, and me in the basketball world and life. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for what you're doing because what you're doing now is just perpetuating for other young players that are looking for something or parents or whatever. So it's really just to pay it forward. You're just paying it forward and, and helping other people with their career in personal and professional because both are critical there. So right. thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Well, thank you all for joining the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is our second interview here with Tom Heights, a 1984 graduate from the University of Kentucky and also my uncle, my dad's younger brother. So thanks so much for joining and stay tuned for the next episode coming in the near future.